Oh, good. Okay, well, I'm Rick Stevenson. Uh, my greatest dist distinction is that I'm a friend of Jesse Harris's. And uh, after that, I'm a filmmaker. I've made 11 feature films, directed loads of television. And um, uh, I'm a teacher at the film school, which puts on the Prodigy Camp, which is for the 20 most talented kids in the world. Uh, we do one week every summer. You can find that out through thefilmschool.com uh, or my personal site, rickstevenson.com. Um, so that's me. What you come to learn as you make films is that films are not about cameras or tape or lighting. Uh, that all goes to support one thing, and that's storytelling. And if you don't have a good story to tell, I don't care how well lit or how well shot your piece is, it's not going to achieve what you want it to achieve. Because people don't connect with, gosh, isn't that a nice tracking shot? They connect to the character and a story that they care about. And so you have to choose stories that you care about that you can make other people's care, people care about. I think the first question to answer when you hear a story that you'd like to tell is, um, why is it important to you? Why has it struck you? And what is it about it that struck you? And it's vital that you identify that because once you do, then you can make sure that as you make your film, which is a long, long process, you keep true to the original thing that inspired you. And that is what's most likely to inspire somebody else. Um, a good example, um, I, call it, I call it my Bazooka Joe moment. And uh, that is, you know, when you put some gum in your mouth and you're chewing gum and uh, start chewing and suddenly that flavor explodes in your mouth, that's your Bazooka Joe moment. And that's the way we listen to stories. We listen, we listen, and suddenly something grabs us. Um, a great example is the Chilean uh, mine disaster. Now, that's filled with potential drama. Uh, more than 30 men caught beneath the ground alive. Uh, for countless days on end. We can't get them out for five months, so they said, um, <clears throat> that sounds like a pretty good story. But if you just go with that story, you're pretty soon going to run against a wall because you're going to go, people are interested in events, but what they connect with is characters. So who are the characters in there? What's going on in their lives that gives you that Bazooka Joe moment? So you've got a good setting, but you don't have the story yet. And a perfect example is when you hear about the guy whose wife is going to have a baby. Um, she is, she's, she's eight months pregnant, um, and this husband is trapped underground while his son is being given a problematic birth, and he can't be there. Um, that's drama. That's a Bazooka Joe moment. But think of the beautiful symbolism of, of, uh, of uh, surrendering the father from Mother Earth at the same time that the child is surrendered from the mother, um, both coming out of the womb of the mother and the earth. Beautiful story. Another great one in there, which we all heard about, was this guy that had a wife and a mistress. Hey, what's that all about? Okay, well, that's drama. Maybe comedy, maybe disaster, who knows? But, you know, it's, it's uh, one of these things where we really want to know what's he going to do, who's he going to choose, who's going to be standing at the top at the uh, end of the story, and why, and is this guy a huge jerk or what? So those are a couple examples of, of uh, finding something within a story that really tells you that there is a story there, and then you could dig deeper. And, and then the next question you really have to ask is, how are you going to tell that story? Um, something that most people don't understand, this is where the skill of screenwriting comes in, and it's like running. If you're on the long-distance uh, uh, running team or even in track, quite frankly, the only way you become better is by running. And you literally can chalk up your achievements by how much mileage you've put in. You know, the more you run, the more fit you become, the more you understand the psychology of running, the better you become. And it's the same with writing. And I'm sorry to tell you that because you just got to sit down and write. And you've got to realize the first thing you write is going to suck. And then you need to go on and on and keep writing more sucky things. And then as you write, it will become less sucky. And as you write, it'll suddenly become okay. And then as you write, you're instead of being afraid of getting everybody's opinion and realizing that they're just being nice to you or they're your family member or they're in fact not being nice to you, but they're being truthful of you, then you actually seek out people because you realize that you only have a chance to tell people a story for the first time once. In this atmosphere of noise, 
they're not going to listen to you a second time. So you want to make sure that before you make a film, before you unleash something on the world, that you've got an incredible story on the page that works for people on the page. If it doesn't work on the page, it won't work in film. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that you learn when you are uh, developing a story is that a lot of it has to do with not so much what you tell, but what you don't tell. How do you order that story to make it dramatic? Everybody knows, of course, that you start with a, um, a hook of some sort. So I'm going to give you a hook. What was the 1940s equivalent of 9-11? Uh, like most of you were kind of alive. Well, were they, Jesse? Some of them <laughs> were alive uh, when you know the uh, Twin Towers got bombed. And everybody remembers that that moment in their life. Well, that moment in the 1940s was December 7, 1941, when the Japanese Imperial Navy um, pulled a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and almost wiped out the entire U.S. fleet, which rendered it almost useless on the United States' west coast undefended. And this looked like the greatest betrayal in history, and it shocked America and woke up a sleeping giant, which then went on, as you know, over five years to defeat the Japanese and, 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 and win the war. But my story that I'm going to tell you in two minutes here starts out with a young man that was in Bellevue High School. He was 17 years old, and he was sitting in his classroom when the news came across the radio of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And suddenly, everything changed, everything in his life, mostly because the next day, the grand majority of his friends, who were 18, went and signed up, quit school, and joined the military. And as a good American, that's what he wanted to do. As an impatient 17-year-old, that's what he wanted to do. He needed to decide, is he going to run away? Is he going to ask his parents? The fact of the matter is he had a pretty good relationship with his parents. And so he went and he talked to them about it. And they realized that he was going to turn 18 in about three years anyway. I'm sorry, three months anyway. And uh, so they talked about it. They didn't want their son to go off to war, but they realized they couldn't stop him. They said, okay, I'll tell you what. If you go speak to your teacher that's been your mentor, this is a guy named Mr. Ogelmeyer, um, and you get his advice, then we'll just back up whatever decision you make. And if you want to go to war, you can go to war. That's the relationship he had with his parents. So fair enough, he honored that request, and he went and spoke to Mr. Ogelmeyer. And Mr. Ogelmeyer said, I will promise you that this war will be waiting for you in a year. But what you need to do, you have so much promise. You're student body president of Bellevue High. You're, you're, on the, you're the captain of the football team. You have all these things going for you. What you need to do is graduate. You need to get one term of university in and then go off and fight the war. So you have something to come back to. This boy considered this, took that advice, finished his high school degree, went off to, to Washington State University. And in that first term at Washington, University, Washington State University is where that young man met my mother. And that is why I'm here. Where is the Bazooka Joe moment in that story? When that young man met my mother. Had I told you right up front, this is a story about my dad, and then told you the same story, it wouldn't have been nearly as intriguing. It gave you, by withholding that information, it gave you something that, that to some degree engaged you and moved you. So that's an example of then learning how to tell the story. And that takes skill, and that takes study, and that takes practice. And that takes coming to Nifty's classes and the film school's classes. <laughs>